So in 1 Samuel chapter 23, I've entitled this sermon, uh, Learning to Trust Leaders. Learning to Trust Leaders. I think we see here that David's men learned to trust him. And we also learned what it takes to, to gain the trust of people that will follow you as a leader. And this is something that, you know, we could probably all apply in some way, shape, or form into our life because we're probably all leaders to some degree in our lives. And not only that, but we're probably all followers to some degree in our life. We probably have people in our lives that we follow as well as having people that we lead. So I believe there's quite a few things that we can glean from this, these passages here tonight. But just to remind us of what has taken place recently here last week in chapter 22, and you know, we saw where David had fled, and he fled from Saul, and his family is following him, and he gives them refuge. And uh, other people come to him, the 400 men, who are also discontent and unhappy with Saul. And then, of course, remember, Saul throws the big pity party under the tree, uh, lamenting you know, his, his, the fact that nobody feels sorry for him. And he ends up, you know, he hears how Doeg, uh, Doeg brings word that Ahimelech the priest had, had, had uh, you know, um, done good unto David. And then Saul, of course, six Doeg on them. And, and Doeg goes to an extreme and ends up just wiping out the entire village, being the implacable reprobate that he was. And Abiathar, uh, the only surviving priest of Eli's cursed lineage, you know, he was the one that finds refuge with David. And that brings us up to where we are today in uh, chapter 23. And really all this chapter is basically about, you know, uh, you know generally speaking, is just David fleeing from, uh, flee, more of David fleeing from uh, the hand of Saul. And of course, in the process of doing that, you know, he delivers uh, Kilo from the Philistines. David flees from Saul to the wilderness of Ziph. Jonathan goes to David. They make that covenant. I don't think I'm going to have a lot of time to talk about that tonight. I'll probably come back to that in a later sermon. Maybe more towards the end. And then, of course, the Ziphites there, they betray David. And then we see Saul, you know, makes a league with them. He expresses his gratitude. And we see his determination to hunt down David. And eventually Saul returns to defend against the Philistines. But it says there in verse 1, Then they told David, saying, Behold, the, Phil the Philistines fight against Keilah, and they rob the threshing floors. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, It's not my problem. <laughs> I'm not king. Why don't you go tell Saul about it? Right? It's interesting that they take the time to come find David. Because maybe they knew David was the type of guy that would actually do something about it because he wasn't preoccupied with just chasing down some guy that he you know, perceived as a threat, like Saul was doing. And that's not David's heart. David inquired of the Lord, and he says, Shall I go and smite these Philistines? And, David, and the Lord said unto David, Go and smite the Philistines and save Keilah. So there, you know, in verse, uh, it seems like the way this goes is David inquires, and God says, Go. And then David's ready to go. And, of course, he goes to his men. He said, all right, we're going to Keilah. We're going to go deliver them. He has confidence in what the Lord has told him, and he believes that the victory is his. But those that are following David, you know, they're not quite so sure. Now, you have to remember, they've just kind of showed up. This is really their first, you know, test with David. And they're saying in verse 3, and the men, David's men said unto him, Behold, we be afraid here in Judah. How much more than if we come to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? He's like, <laughs> saying, we're running for our life. Here, you want to go to war and fight in Keilah, in Judah? You want to you know, expose ourselves against these Philistines? And David, you know, he inquires again. But it's interesting what I think is going on here is that David's not inquiring again for his own sake. I think David's mind's already made up. You know, David's already said that the Lord's already told me what to do. I'm ready to go do it. But he's got these men that are following him, and he's their leader and, you know, he doesn't get upset with them. He doesn't rebuke them. He doesn't, you know, scold them. He's saying, well, I told you what to do. You need to go do it. Don't you believe that God's on my side, that I'm the one leading the show here? And he didn't have to get all puffed up and beat his chest. He said, you know what, if you guys have any doubts, well, let me just go ask again. Put your hearts at ease. So it says in verse 4, then David inquired of the Lord yet again. And, of course, the Lord, being the great leader that he is, doesn't rebuke David, saying, didn't I just tell you? What are you doing here again, David? He says, he gives, and the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into thine hand. And what we can learn from this is that, you know, when it comes to learning to trust leaders, is that you have to understand that, that the, and this is probably more for people who are leading than following, but leaders should oblige those that are following them. You know, leaders need to be patient with people. The Bible says that, the man of God must not strive, but must be gentle towards all men. You know, they must be willing, you know, must be patient, you know, apt to teach. You know, a leader has to oblige those that are following them from time to time. 
I think sometimes people get in a place of leadership and they think, well, everybody needs to just see what a great leader I am and understand that I'm just going to make every right decision and just fall right in line. And if anybody who doesn't, anybody has any doubts about what I'm doing here, well, you know, they must be this or that or the other thing. That's not David's attitude. David, when he gets the word from the Lord to go and fight and deliver Keilah, he's ready to go. He's ready to fight. His men say, well, I'm not so sure about this. You know, he says, well, let me go inquire of the Lord again. He obliged them, right? And what we need to understand this as leaders is that not everybody is at the same level of faith. If you would, go over to Matthew chapter 14. You have to understand that not everybody is at the same level that you're at. You could apply this to a work situation. You could apply this in the home. You could apply this in a church. You know, you might be a supervisor or, or something in, a, in, a, in your job. You got some new guy comes on the scene. Some, you know, the new guy shows up. You know, he might not know everything or know how to do everything exactly the way your company does things. You know, instead of just jumping down his throat, you might want to just take the time to oblige him. You know, to inquire, right? And to say, hey, what do you know? What don't you know? Well, here's how we do things. And explain. Because not everybody is going to be at the same level of faith. You know, we're talking probably more in the context of a church. You know, we're, we have leaders here people that lead in the local church, you can't expect as a leader for everybody to just walk through the door and be exactly where you are in the Christian life. <clears throat> and you have to remember too, specifically you know, pertaining to David and these men, is the people that are following David at this point, are, point aren't exactly you know, the, the cream of the crop. You know, the, the, if you remember last week in, in chapter 22, it was everyone that was in distress Everyone that was in debt, everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him. And he became a captain over them. Again, he wasn't looking for it. It says he became one because they all came to him and said, hey, you're our leader now. These are people that have a distrust of leadership to begin with. People who had had a bad experience with Saul, they're kind of coming in maybe with a little bit of a chip on their shoulder saying, are you really sure that's what God wants us to do, David? And David says, well, I'm not Saul. Who do you think I am? Saul? No, he says, well, let me pray and ask again. He's exercising patience here. You know, and this is a great example of, you know, that we can see, uh, you know, Jesus is a great example of this type of leadership. Someone who was patient with those that were following. Somebody who didn't expect everybody to just be exactly where, they, uh, where he expected them to be. He understood that people were at different levels of faith that were following him. You know, the, we remember the story of Matthew 8, where he goes into the ship and there's that great tempest in the sea, and that it was in so much that it covered the uh, the ship with uh, with wave, that it was the ship was covered with waves, and Jesus is back sleeping, saying, "Oh, God's got this. I'm not worried about this." And his disciples came to him and woke him, and, and saying, "Lord, save us. We uh, we perish." And he saith unto them, "Why are ye so fearful, O ye of little faith?" Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marvelled at saying, "What manner of man is this? Yet even the winds and the seas obey him." So early on in their ministry with Jesus Christ, they're following him. They had to kind of learn a few things. They had to learn that, you know, what, who Jesus really was, what he was capable of. And then they, became, they came to a place of trusting him more and more and more. That's what we see with David's. When you see it in this, exact, in, in this chapter, you're there in Matthew chapter 14. You know, the disciples, they were left wondering at the end of that story. They said, what manner of man is this? But look at Matthew chapter 14 when another storm comes in verse 22 and straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into ship and to go before him unto the other side and while he sent the multitudes away and he sent the multitudes away he went up into a mountain apart to pray and when the evening has come there alone but the ship was now in the midst of the sea tossed with waves for the wind was contrary and in the fourth watch of the night Jesus went unto them walking on the sea and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea they were troubled saying it is a spirit and they cried out for fear but straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good courage, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. So you can see where Peter's faith's gone up a little bit. He said, Well, I remember the last time we were in a boat and the Lord was around. And he just spoke and the wave stopped. So we see that there's this growth in his faith. And of course, we know the story in verse 29. And he said, Come. And Peter was come down out of the ship. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said to him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? When they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. And they that were in ship were, came and worshipped him. So it's a little bit of a different ending to the story. I mean, it's a ship. It's a storm. The last time Jesus does this great miracle, they say, well, what manner of man is this? That even the winds of, 
What's going on here? But they follow Jesus a little bit more. They learned a little bit more about him. And then when the same thing happens again, how does the story end? They're coming at his feet and they're worshiping him, saying, of a truth, thou art the Son of God. So we see that leaders should oblige those that are following. They should be patient with them. They should allow them to come along and grow and to get to where they need to be. <clears throat> but it's interesting to notice what, took it, you know, what it took to get Peter where he needed to be, right? It took a, it took a storm or two. You see, it takes, it takes the same faith to trust in, in more practical matters that pertain to us. You know, we say, well, I'm following Jesus, but I don't expect in my life that I'm ever going to be told to, hey, step out of a ship and walk on the water. So what, why do I need to have such great faith? What do I need to worry about, you know, growing in my faith? You know, why, why, do, why does uh, somebody who's leaning somebody like that need to worry about, hey, well, this person, you know, isn't, isn't ever going to have to be or do what Peter did. So why should I oblige them? Why should I be patient with them? Why should I wait for them to grow in faith and get where they need to be? Because it actually takes the same faith to trust in more practical matters. Go over to Matthew chapter 6. That's what Jesus reminded us of. Reminded us of. You say, well, I'm never going to step out in faith. I don't, I don't literally walk out of a boat or something like this, do some great miracle. No, you're just going to have to trust God to provide all your needs. You just need to trust God to give you food and raiment every day. You know, that's pretty practical, isn't it? We like to think of faith in these big terms, you know, these big, these big events and these big things that we're, I'm going to have to exercise faith and, you know, raise somebody from the dead or do some great miracle. A lot of people just struggle to have enough faith to just trust God from day to day. You know, in these days, that's something that we really need to focus on. How much are we really trusting, on, trusting in God to help us through day to day? Just making ends meet. Look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. He said, No man can serve two masters, for you'll hate the one and love the other, or else you hold the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Wherefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor, what, yet what for, uh, yet for, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. I say, don't, don't think about what I'm going to eat or drink. Are you, sure, are you sure Jesus was a Baptist? <laughs> and that's what he's saying here. Like, don't even worry about what you're going to eat. Don't even worry about what you're going to drink. Don't even worry about the clothes you're going to put on. Is not the life more than beat, and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they eat, neither they get into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. It's like God feeds the birds. Aren't you worth more than that? Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? And why take ye thought for the raiment? Consider the, lily of the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon, all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Look at verse 31. He said, Therefore take no thought, saying, What we shall eat, or what we shall drink, or with we shall be clothed. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth what things ye have need of, uh, that ye have need of all these things. And we say, Oh yeah, I know. Yeah, I know God knows what I need. But then we find ourselves in need, and, and, and I wonder, where, where do we turn? Are we, are, is that, that's the time to exercise faith. And we want to look at Peter and what he did, walking on the water, and say, Wow, what great faith. You know, you need the same amount of faith to just trust God day to day. He said in verse 33, But seek ye, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought of the things of itself, sufficient in the days the either of, the evil thereof. You know, how can you expect to walk on water if you can't even trust God for his daily provision? <laughs> and all I'm saying tonight is this, is that, you know, when David's men came to him and said, are you sure you really want to go deliver Keilah? I mean, we're afraid here. What do, you, what do you mean you want to go fight the Philistines? David didn't jump down their throat. David didn't rebuke them. David just said, you know what? They're just not there yet. They're just not there yet. They need to grow. So let me just go pray, inquire the Lord again, and just put their hearts at rest. That's what we saw with the disciples. They got in a storm and they, they didn't know what to do, what to think. Jesus calms the storm, and they're going, who is this? What manner of man is this? They had to grow. They had to learn. They got there. And the next time it comes around, Peter's jumping out of the boat, <laughs> running over there. Leaders should trust the Lord and be patient with followers who need experience to trust their leadership. Let me say that again because it's a mouthful. Leaders should trust the Lord and be patient with followers who need experience to trust their leadership. You know, 
people who are in leadership positions, they need to just trust God, be patient with those that are following. And again, you could apply this in so many situations. We were all, we're all in leadership and, and, fo- and, and, and follower positions in our life to some degree or another. And we need to just be patient with those that are following us and just understand that they need experience. That trust is something that is earned. It's not something that's demanded. It's something that the people have to learn to say, see you go through things, watch you lead, and go, okay, I can trust this person. And we think about, you know, Paul. Go over to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. You know, Paul was able to admonish Timothy, having been an example to him. I mean, Paul was Timothy's leader, and Paul asked, you know, he, he told him to do some hard things. He was telling him, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. You know, that rolls right off the tongue, but it's another thing to do it. It's another thing to get up and reprove. It's another thing to get up and rebuke. You know, preaching's hard. That's what he, you know, he, but he, that's what was expected of Timothy. And Paul was able to lay that charge on him, having been an example to him. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, thou, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Therefore, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Well, who are you, Paul, to put that charge on me? Easy for you to say, to tell me that I should endure hardness. Yeah, except Paul did that. Paul's endured his fair share of hardness. Probably more than anybody else is going to. At least at this point. And he told him in 2 Timothy, go over to 2 Timothy chapter 3, but he said in 2 Timothy 1, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me, in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus, that good thing which is committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in thee. He's giving him this charge to preach and to teach and to endure hardness. And he was able to do that because of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10. That thou hast fully known my doctrine, thou hast fully known my doctrine, and what? My manner of life, my purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. So Paul was able to put this kind of a charge on the one that was following him, Timothy, because he knew that Timothy had seen all his persecutions. Timothy knew, he knew that Timothy had seen all his afflictions that came unto him in all these different places. He knew that Timothy knew his manner of life, his purpose of faith. And that's why he's able to say, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and been sure of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. You know, people who are in leadership positions, they need to understand that that if you want to gain people's following, you have to be an example. You can't just demand that people fall in line and, and do what you want them to do without you yourself doing it. Again, trust is something that is built. Trust in leadership is something that is built. It is something that is built through testing, through having gone through things. It's not, you know, available on demand. I can't, you can't just walk up to people and, and just say, would you just download some trust? Would you just get an app on your phone that's going to help you trust leadership or whatever? It's something that leadership has to build and those that are following them through going through things, through going through these experiences. And it's something that we should go through because of the fact that when you learn to trust leadership, a lot of great things happen. When you have a good leader uh, leading and you have people that trust that leader that are following, good things begin to happen. There's a lot of benefits. <laughs> Learning to trust a, a leaders, you know, that delivers us from danger. If you would, go over to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. Say, well, I don't know if I want, why do we even have to have leadership? Why does somebody have to be in charge? Well, one, one reason is this, for protection. Somebody, it has to be somebody's job to protect other people, to protect the followers. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. It says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who also am an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the 
glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, not as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. So there's that idea again of a leader being an sample or an example to those that are following. But look at verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary as the devil, uh, your adversary the devil uh, as a roaring lion walking, walketh about. Why should they be vigilant? Why should they take the oversight thereof? Why should they be the example of the flock? For protection, because there is a spiritual reality that we live in where we have an adversary called the devil who is seeking whom he may devour. Say, well, you know, I don't need church. I don't need anybody leading me. I don't need anybody preaching to me. I'll be fine. You're going to get chewed up. You're going to get chewed up. You're going to go out there and, and people get out of church and they get backslidden. And the next, and it, it, they can't see it, but it's like it's spiritually what it looks like is the devil. It's like a cat just toying with a mouse. The Bible says they are taken captive of him at his, at, at his will. You ever see a cat play with its, a mouse? Let's it get away a little bit and brings it back, throws it up in the air, lets it get away again, brings it back. Some people live their whole Christian life like that. Because they, they don't think that they need to be protected from anything. That they don't need anybody to lean over them. <clears throat> we go over to Acts chapter 20. I mean, that's why it's one of the requirements for a bishop, you know, for a pastor. To be vigilant, to be sober. You know, that's one of his requirements. His job is to be vigilant, to do what? To keep vigil, to watch over the flock. To protect it from spiritual danger, false doctrine, sin, type of things that try to creep into a church. Look at Acts chapter 20, verse 17. It says, And from Miletus he, went, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. Verse 28, so he's speaking to the elders. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you not sparing the flock. Why should leaders take the time to be patient with, the, with, with the, those that are following them and be an example and gain their trust? And why should we as followers be willing to trust leaders and follow them? Because of the fact when you do that, you have somebody protecting you, watching over you, and making sure that you don't get chewed up by the devil or that some grievous wolf isn't going to enter into the church and, and devour. <coughs> That's one of the benefits from having leadership and learning to trust that leadership. Another benefit from learning to trust leadership is the fact that you deliver other people. Not only are you yourself under some kind of a protection, you have somebody else looking out for you, praying for you, preaching to you, teaching you. And, you know, this could go for children to parents. You know, kids are, are under the protection of their, their parents. Someone is watching out for them, saying, don't do that, do this. Look out for this. Here's this pitfall in life. Make the, and, then, and guiding them and leading them. It helps us. We benefit from it. But not only that, but learning to trust leadership delivers other people. If you would, go back to 1 Samuel chapter 23. <coughs> Notice in our story there again, David is you know, trying to lead these men to go deliver the city of Kelah. They are doubting. They're saying, well, we're kind of new here, David. We're not really sure that you're our guy, I mean, we're here, you're our leader, you're our captain, but you really want to go do this? And he's patient with them, he inquires again. And when they learn to trust him, verse 5, it says, So David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their cattle and smote them with the great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. You know, that's what's great about the local church when you have a good leader and good followers is not only are, are the people that are there going to be protected when you're under somebody who is sober and vigilant, but then you can actually go out and deliver other people. You can go fight a battle. And that's what we're doing here. It's exactly, that's what we went and did this evening. Went out there and stormed the gates of hell trying to deliver souls. Went to try to bring people out of the, the, you know, the, the, the snare of the devil by preaching them the gospel, knocking these doors. That's what we're doing every time we go out. We're trying to deliver the inhabitants of Tucson from the spiritual Philistines that are, are, are robbing them of eternal life. Look at verse 6. And it came to pass when Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, fled to David, uh, to Keilah, he came down with an ephod in his hand. And it was told Saul that David was come to Keilah. And Saul said, God hath delivered him into mine hand. 
you know, what's going on here, Saul? <laughs> eh, wrong. For he is shut in by entering into the town that hath gates and bars. You know, I'm not really going to go on about this. It's kind of, but as a side note to what I'm preaching, not the main point. But you can't really read that and not comment on it. It's just the fact that, and, I, and, I, and I'm just tempted because it ties in so, so much with what's going on right now is that bad leaders can't face reality. <laughs> Do with that what you will, right? Bad leaders can't face reality. You know, they lose an election, it's rigged. <laughs> you know what? And maybe it was rigged. You know what? Let me just go off for a minute. Maybe this election was rigged. And, it, and it's like, the, why are we still participating in rigged elections? Maybe, why are we participating in such a corrupt, broken system? I want to just find, you know, you can go online and find out who voted. You don't see what they voted for. Like that YouTube ad took the time to tell me when I was trying to watch something else. You know, your friends and family can see whether or not you voted. They don't know who you voted for, but I'm just like, oh, the guilt. <laughs> just biting my nails. Are they going to look and see I didn't vote? But now I'm tempted to go on there and look and see, well, and find out all my friends who voted and invite them over for a board game and just let them know, hey, I'm going to cheat the whole night. You still want to play? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm just to make an analogy. It's what it reminds me of. That's why I don't vote and I don't play with cheaters. Right? Anyway, I got that off my chest finally. It's been stewing. But Saul here, he's just like, God, it delivered in my hand. And nothing could be further from the truth. He's a bad leader, and he can't face reality. And he's going to get the people that follow him into hot water eventually. And unfortunately, look at verse 8. And Saul called all the people together to war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. And David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him. And he said to Biathar the priest, Bring hither the ephod. Then said David, O Lord God of Israel, a servant has certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Keilah deliver me up into his hand? Will Saul come down as thy servant hath heard? O Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell thy servant. And the Lord said to him, He will come down. Then said David, Will the men of Keilah deliver uh, me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, They will deliver thee up. <clears throat> so we see again here that learning to trust leadership, you know, it delivers other people. And it'll deliver you. You know, if you, <laughs> it'll deliver you out of this circumstance. You know, you know, you got a good leader who's looking out for you. He's going to get you out of harm's way. But learning to trust leadership allows the work to get done. David here, he's making a good call, going to the Lord. Look at verse 13. Then David and his men, which were about 600, arose and departed out of Keilah and went whithersoever they could go. And it was told Saul that, uh, that David was escaped from Keilah and that he forbeared to go forth. So David's men, it's interesting at this, po at this point, they don't doubt his leadership. You see how they grew there? See how the first time he said, hey, we're going to Keilah, we're going to deliver it. He said, are you sure? So he has to inquire again. This time he goes and inquires, and they're just like, yeah, just go. There's no second inquir inquiry to the Lord. He they don't say, well, are you sure? They've gone through the battle. They've seen that God is with him. They've trusted this leader. He's delivered on his promises. And they're like, okay, now we can trust this guy. Now we can get something and we can get we can get something done. They have seen God's deliverance. <clears throat> you know, and that's why we need to learn to trust leadership in our life. If we have good leadership. Now I'm not saying blind trust. I'm not saying when leadership goes bad that we just say, well, you know, I trust him. When it's just blatantly obvious, you know, when somebody's, you know, a pastor has disqualified himself. Or whatever, you know, you got a bad boss or something like that. I understand that, okay? That's, of course, the caveat here. But when we do have good leadership, you know, we should learn to trust that leadership and follow it. Because that's how we're going to get something done. You're not going to get anything done by not being willing to follow, not to be able to do what they do and, and go wherever so they, they could go. And that's the whole point of leadership in the church. You know, it's, it's, you know, narrowing it into the church, that's the purpose behind leadership. The Bible, Bible says in Ephesians 4, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for what? So that they could, you know, have some eyeballs on them a few times a week or because they just liked hearing the sound of their voice? Or No, he gave them that for the perfecting of the saints, to make the saints whole, to teach and to preach. 
to help people to understand what it is they need to do to live the Christian life. And what else? For the work of the ministry, to get something done. That's why God has given us leadership in the local church, is so that we can get something done for him, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying the body of Christ. Look, when we have good leadership, trust it. And I understand if, we have, we, if there's some hesitancy at the beginning, especially if, you're, if we're one who's come from bad leadership. You know, I've seen things go south in a church. I know what's possible that things can, you know, things can go bad. You know, maybe we're going to come into it with a little bit of a chip on our shoulder. Like David's men. They're discontented. They're in debt. They're all these things. And they're hesitant to follow David. I mean, they know David's good. They know that he's his, God's anointed. They know that he's the next in line to the throne, that God's going to use him. But even all, knowing and understanding all that, they're still what? They're still hesitant to follow him. Until David has to patiently inquire the Lord again and then prove himself as a good leader. But look, once somebody has gone through that, once you've learned and seen that you can trust somebody, trust them. Trust them. Why? For the work of the ministry to get something done, to go deliver some people and to stay protected spiritually. Because trustworthy leadership, you know, the, the trustworthy leadership isn't in it for the position. You're not, they're not in it for their health. They're in it for the purpose, right? The work of the ministry. Learning to trust leadership allows the work to get done. Learning to trust leadership delivers other people. Learning to trust leadership keeps us protected. And not only that, but learning to trust leadership protects, uh, <laughs> protects us as well. Look at uh, chapter 14. And it says, And David abode in the wilderness and strongholds and remained in a mountain in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day, but God delivered him not into his hand. You know, and it's not because Saul was inept. You know, it, it tells you why God, why Saul wasn't able to find him. It wasn't because Saul was, you know, Elmer Fudd out there, you know, bumbling around with his stupid hat and his court gun or something. It's because God delivered him every day. Meaning this, that if God hadn't been involved, Saul would have caught him. You know, why, I mean, David is, you could tell David is, has a, a reasonable fear, amount of fear here. You know, he's fleeing, he's fleeing this, he's in this stronghold, he's in this wood, he's in this mountain. I mean, you read it out, you read the end there, they're literally going around the, around the mountain. And he's seeking him every day trying to get him. But God delivered him out of his hand. You know, we should trust leadership because it keeps us protected. It gets God on our side. And when God's on your side, you know, God before us, who can be against us? And boy, do we need that today. You know, no matter the odds, no matter how bad it is. I mean, the Ziphites here in the story, if you noticed, they, they betray David. I mean, it's not just that Saul's out there looking for him. He's, David's got people going to him saying, this is where he is. And, and then they're conspiring and saying, well, hey, you go, mate, you go find out where his haunt is and confirm that he's there, and then I'll come and we'll get him. So it's not just Saul out there. It's this conspiracy. Meaning this, that when we trust leadership, when we have good leadership and we learn to trust it, God is going to deliver us, keep us safe, keep us protected against all odds. Even if there's this big conspiracy to do us harm. <clears throat> you saw that through chapter, you know, verses 15 through 25, where these Ziphites, and we won't take time to read it for sake of time, but they're conspiring to get him. <clears throat> and I want to end just by saying this tonight, is that you know, God blesses good leadership. God blesses good leadership. Even if that leadership has bad, fo bad followers. Even if that, you know, there's a good leader in place, and the, but the people are following, you're just kind of, meh. Or they're just bad people. God's still going to bless that leader. <laughs> but more importantly than that, what we should learn is this, that good, God blesses good leadership and those that follow it. He blesses those that follow it. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13, I'll read to you, it says, <coughs> Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. And look, that's a big ask. Especially for us as men. To say, because I mean, all men are natural born leaders. 
and our and we are uh, we are distrust we distrust others naturally just out of self-preservation say i'm not anyway i'm not going to submit to some other guy my man what you have to understand is that when you're submitting to good leadership in the local church, you're not submitting to some man behind the pulpit. You're submitting to God. You're submitting to God-deigned authority. You know, and we do that all the time without even thinking about it. Most of the time. <laughs> we go out, we follow man's laws, we follow man's rules all the time. We're, you know what you're doing? You're submitting to those that have the rule over you. But sometimes we get in a church, in that church position, and people are just kind of like, well, I'm not going to submit to that guy. And look, don't submit to that guy. Submit to the word of God. That's all that the Bible's asking you. Those that have rule over you within the church. I'm not saying you have to throw your doors open and let you know, the pastor come in and inspect your house. Because that would be a cult. That would be weird. But within the local church, you know, within the authority that it has, you know, we should be willing to go along with the program. And trust good leadership when we have it. Because God will bless it. And look at verse 26. And Saul went on this side of the mountain, and David and his men on this side of the mountain. And David made haste to go away for fear of Saul, and Saul and his men compassed David and his men round about to take them. I mean, he's got them cornered. It almost seems like it's, they're going down. But, but, verse 27, there came a messenger unto Saul, saying, you know you have a real job to do? <laughs> You're out here just running around like an idiot, chasing some guy. You have actual, real leadership problems that you have to deal with. <laughs> Haste thee and come, for the Philistines have invaded the land. Wherefore Saul returned from pursuing after David and went against the Philistines. Do you think that's a coincidence? Do you think that the, the Philistines just showed up unknowingly? I mean, the Philistines probably didn't know, know it, but... God did that. And you know what's real interesting about that is that who is it that attacked the Philistines earlier? Was it Saul? It was David. Isn't that interesting? David's the one that goes and delivers the people of Hela and, and smites the Philistines, takes away all their stuff, and just sends them running. You'd think they'd be mad at David and say, well, let's go get him. No, they go and fight one of Saul's cities where he's reigning. That's not a coincidence. Saul had to deal with the Philistines that David offended. And just goes to show you that when you're following good leadership and doing what you're supposed to do, God is going to bless you and protect you even against all odds. The Bible says, When a man's way please the Lord, when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Now think about what that's saying in Proverbs 16. He says, When a man's ways please the Lord, right? You know, when we're faithful and we love, we, we love the Lord, we love His Word, we submit to His Word, we submit to the God-given authority in our lives, be it in the local church, be it in the home, husbands to wives, children to parents, men to the Lord, so on and so forth. When our ways please the Lord, He maketh even His enemies to be at peace with Him. Right? Meaning our enemies are going to, it's like they're, they're going to leave us alone. Just like we saw in this story. David's doing what he's supposed to do. He's going when he's supposed to go. He's delivering who he's supposed to deliver. His men are following him. Their ways please the Lord. And, and even though it seems like they're about to go down, Saul's got him compassed about. That's when the Philistines show up and Saul's got to take off and go deal with things. He maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Now, it doesn't say that he gives his enemies peace. You know, there's, that doesn't mean that the enemies have peace. It just means that they have peace with him, meaning they're not going to go after your enemy isn't going to come after you. Look, your enemies are still going to have their problems. It's not like, well, if I do what I'm supposed to do and everything, and, I, and I, my ways please the Lord, then you know my en everything's going to go okay for my enemies too. No. It just means that they're going to leave you alone. They're still going to have all their problems. Saul still had to go fight the Philistines. You know, David's ways please the Lord, and Saul ended up leaving him alone, but Saul still had his own bag of problems that he had to go deal with. It doesn't say his enemies are at peace too. And what that should remind us is that, you know, God, vengeance belongeth unto God. You know, and we need to leave, let God deal with our enemies often and not take matters into our own hands. And that's what made David such a trustworthy leader, right? Was his trust in the Lord.
to just trust God. David understood this. He knew that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. And we, we'll see it coming up in, in, in real soon, where David has opportunity to kill his own enemy, but doesn't do it. But he just trusts God to deliver him. That's the kind of leader we want, somebody who just trusts God. Trust God th that, that if we just do the right thing, that is just focused on what we need to be focused on and, and making sure our ways please the Lord, that the enemies will take care, God will take care of our enemies for us. And he'll do a much better job than we ever could. That's what made David such a trustworthy leader, his trust in the Lord. I don't imagine after this, any of David's men had any problem following David. After they see his patience with them, saying, okay, I'll inquire again, reassuring them, then delivering on what he said was going to take place and, going and, and, and helping the people of uh, Keilah, delivering those people, and, and then watching him lead them out of harm's way time and time again by his trust in the Lord. I don't imagine after this that they had any trouble following David. His men learned to trust him. But how do they, how do they come to learn to trust him? How did that happen? Because out of David's charm, out of his charisma, his wit, his, his people skills? No, it was when they saw his own faith tested. You know, and if we want people to follow us and trust us and, 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 to, and trust our leading, you know, we have to lead by example. And that might require us having to have our own faith tested. When those that are supposed to be following us see us go through some trials, see us trust in God, and see us get delivered, and see God work on our behalf, then they say, okay, I can follow you. So we need to learn to trust leadership. When you have good leadership, learn to trust it. And I understand that, that it's learned. It's not something that's innate. It's not something that often I would even say is natural. It's something that has to be put into practice. It's something that has to be learned. But you need to learn it. And once we have it, you know what? Great things can happen. We can get some things done. When you have a good leader and good followers and God's blessing and our ways as a church are pleasing the Lord, God will take care of our enemies to the point where we don't have to worry about fighting them. We can go deliver other people. We don't have to worry about the enemies of this church coming and trying to do something else. We can go deliver other people from their foes. We can go find the unsaved and deliver them from their enemy, the devil, and sin. But it all starts with trust. It all starts with learning to trust leadership. Let's go ahead and pray.